Hello, hello, everyone. I'm Ben Pick from the OWASP NOVA chapter, and thank you for joining us for another virtual meetup. I have with me Rob Cuddy, and I just want to get started by saying that we don't have a, a meetup plan for next month yet. Uh, so if you are interested in giving a talk or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to myself, Abdullah Munawar, or Sean Porce, and we'll be happy to uh, try and plan something for the fall. That being said, we are working towards a big event come the end of the year. And when that, uh, when we get more details ironed out for that, we will post them up in our usual platforms. So without any further ado, Rob, uh, can you uh, take it away with DevSecOps and IoT? Excellent. I'm happy to, Ben, and thanks for having me. Um, hey, good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about application security, DevSecOps, and IoT. And I'm going to date myself a little bit here on the front end, because whenever I hear things in threes, I'm instantly transported back to the yellow brick road in uh, the Wizard of Oz. And so I always have to add in the oh my in my mind. So that's where the uh, where the title comes from. Um, but where, where this is really coming from for me is that, that IoT is a space that is exploding, right? And I don't need to tell you that, but when we start thinking about all of the different places where it intersects, and you know, for me, I've been in the DevOps space for a long time. I worked at IBM for 14 years, and then prior to that, I was a configuration management specialist for another 13. So um, that'll give you some idea of my age. But uh, I've seen a lot of different things where connections happen and integration matters. And when I look at IoT, I think about sensors and I think about all of the different devices, but then I realize there's an application behind it, right? Something is happening with the data, somebody's doing something, and we need to make sure that that stuff is secure. And so that's where this intersection is coming from. And when I look at why IoT matters, well, it's because it's everywhere and it's everyone and it's vulnerable, right? So we'll talk about those kinds of things, but whether it's the Echo B that's in your house controlling temperature, whether it's your coffee maker or the Roomba um, over in the lower right-hand corner, that's my you know Fitbit stats from one day um, pre-pandemic. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to get 25,000 steps walking around your house, but, it's everywhere around us and everything hits. So I don't know how many of you um, follow the EFF Foundation or some of the other folks, but some of the things that are going on, like why should we care about this? Well, one of the big things right now is the discussion around bias and whether or not we can trust sort of the data that's going on. And so the intersection there with IoT and machine learning or uh, augmented reality or artificial intelligence, right? And so this quote on the left uh, from my friend Ava talking about how facial expression data um, can can have some bias in it. And, you know, I loved her comment about this is my least surprised face, right? That we would, we would think that's in there because of the way things are coded. And so it goes back to how these things are put together. And then over on the right, I had a quote from Mark Curfee, who's a friend of mine, a road cyclist um, like myself, but also working in security. Um, and he recently put a quote out there saying, hey, you know, privacy is a feature of the operating system. But I love the second part. He goes, I wonder when I will consider security as a built in feature to a product or that, that, you know, companies put together. And, and it was really kind of thoughtful for me thinking through that, yes, do we think about security when we're using the applications and, and doing the things that we're doing? Um, and this came to light for me very recently. I have a 17 year old son who was on his first job and he got his first real paycheck. Um, and, and kind of the first one was direct deposit. So no worries there, but the second one, the direct deposit system wasn't working. And so he got a paper check. And so on the drive home from, from work, you know, he's sitting there and he pulls out his phone and he wants to, you know, do the mobile banking thing and take the picture of the check and, and send it in. And so I stopped him in the car and I said, Hey, you know what, why not wait until you get home? And, you know, we're on our network and our Wi-Fi. it's just a little bit more secure, you know, and that kind of thing. But it didn't even occur to him to think through that, hey, somebody could intercept that. Or if I'm just on a public Wi-Fi or something like that, that could be vulnerable. And now my information's out there, right? So when I talk about why we should care, it gets down into real world examples of where data privacy and security and innovation all intersect with convenience and people are trading every day, right? Convenience for 
uh, functionality. And so when I really think about this, it's not just where those things intersect, but it's where your data and your privacy and your innovation and your convenience all intersect with security. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to put this together. So how many of you may be Garmin users? Um, you may remember just a few weeks ago, right? There was a whole big outage with Garmin where they were down for over a day or so. And if you were a user of Fitbit or Strava or maybe S Health or some of these other, you know, kind of health and wearable apps, uh, you couldn't get information in. Now, I have a friend of mine in Ireland, and during the pandemic, one of the things he's very, very proud of is how many days in a row he's been able to run. And he got up to 159 uh, and then had this issue with Garmin. And so goes out for his run, gets the data in there, and then all of a sudden it's not uploading, streak ends, everyone's sad, right? That's a simple story. But then all of a sudden you think about all of the things that that's connected to and all of the different information that's in there. Imagine if this is more of something monitoring a health for say a diabetic patient and looking at blood sugar or transmitting sleep information to a doctor because a patient has a CPAP machine at home and they're trying to get measurements and see whether the oxygenation levels are, are right or stuff like that. So these things have real world implications when they go down on us and can be very, very disruptive. Um, Another kind of thing here, and I thought this was really interesting, when we look at security in the Internet of Things, right, my comment here about that, even the Oxford Dictionary knows that security is an issue here. So if you were to go look up Internet of Things, you'd see this definition come up. And if you look at the kind of grayish quote down on the bottom, it says, if one thing can prevent the Internet of Things from transforming the way we live and work, it will be a breakdown in security. Right? And that, again, is because all of these things are talking to each other. And if we can't trust it, then we can't really use it very well. So what are people really worried about, though? What's going on? Well, the biggest things are the number of devices that are out there. And we're up to about 21 and a half billion. So that's by 2025, not too far away. And that comes from kind of the, the status of dot com folks. Mm -hmm. um, OWASP was concerned about this as well and has recently put out their top 10 you know, list for the Internet of Things. And the number one thing that was on there is what they called weak and guessable and hard coded passwords. So how many of us when we go and we, we got our first router and we set it up at home? Hopefully all of us went in and we changed the admin password and we made configuration settings because we work in this space and we understand that. But how many folks don't? How many folks leave the default passwords set on the devices and the implementations that they use in their homes? How many people have done that for the Nests and the Echo Bees and Alexa and all of those things, right? Those are out there. And when we hard code those things in and we make them easy to find, we make ourselves vulnerable. And what are people doing? Well, they're doing a lot of ransomware. That's been a big, big thing here in the pandemic day. Um, and what's happening in a lot of those cases is it's not so much they're trying to get individuals on their devices, but they're using those devices to get into a corporate network. And so because people are now connecting from home and leveraging their own equipment and you're mixing kids who are doing distance learning with parents who are trying to work with all of the normal kind of other things we were doing, whether it was on Instagram or Snapchat or whether we were watching YouTube videos or things like that, all of those things now intersect and they're all kind of, you know, flooding the same networks. And, and how do you make sure that those things are secure? How does a corporate CISO be able to identify, you know, a threat uh, on his network from a device that's coming from someone legitimate? How do they streamline that out? How do they make sure people are using VPNs and, and those kinds of things? So there's a lot of concern in the space uh, over that. So what do we do? Right. Well, this is where we're going to start talking about kind of DevOps and, and things like that. But one of the things I think is a real challenge in this space in particular, um, and IoT kind of explodes it out because of the number of devices that we're talking about, is do our tools really work together? So when I go around and I talk to CISOs and executives, one of the common threads I hear over and over again is that we don't really know where our risk posture is, right? We have a hard time getting a holistic view of what our risk looks like. And it's because they have anywhere from 30 to 40 to in some cases, you know, 130 tools that really don't talk very well to each other. They do a nice job sort of dashboarding their own thing. But when you try to bring all of those things together into a holistic profile to be able to answer the question, how likely are we to be breached or how secure are we compared to a year ago? 
it's a very difficult problem for them to solve. And so in a lot of places, you're seeing standardization efforts kind of making that pendulum swing back. You're seeing some consolidation. Um, people are moving away from kind of the best practice things. And maybe this looks a little bit like your organization, right? You've got tools everywhere and hopefully some of these look familiar and you kind of, uh, you know, they're using some of them themselves, right? We all know about Jenkins. We're all familiar with Git. You know, we know about Puppet and, and Chef and things like that, but they're all over. And if we really want to understand risk well, we need to understand how the tool sets we're working with are interacting with one another and being able to bubble up those risk profiles a little bit better so that we can make decisions on where we're going to invest our time and energy in measuring and mitigating the risk around us. So um, I thought this was a really good quote that we picked up, you know, in a, in a recent conference from Black Hat, right, when I was sitting in there. Uh, and it was simply this, right? An organization saying, hey, we collect more than 300,000 new and malicious files and application scripts that we never saw before every day. That gives you an idea of the scale and the scope and the difficulty that we're, that we're talking about um, and things coming from everywhere and anywhere, right? So this organization picking that, that number up, I thought that was very, very eye-opening, um, giving us an idea of, of what's happening there. And there's been a recent kind of security standard that's come out, the ETSI, you know, EN303, and you see the number there. But what I've highlighted in here is all of the different cybersecurity protections related to IoT, right? And you can see the very first one is no universal default passwords. And then it talks about, you know, having a means to manage your vulnerabilities, um, making it easy for users to delete data, right? So can we make it obvious for users to clean up after themselves, right? We, we know, hey, don't put sensitive information out there, but can we make it easy for them to remove data that would normally persist, things like that, right? So all of these now starting to become regulatory issues, starting to be able to influence how things are coming together. Okay, so let's talk about DevOps for a second and, and where some of these things I think are gonna make a big difference. And we'll kind of use this uh, a little bit uh, and come back to it some towards the end. But some of the things that I think we wanna talk about is securing in the planning. So when we talk about IoT and we talk about devices and things like that, are we involving security at that outset? When we think about the sensor that we're gonna build or the embedded device that we're working with, um, here is, is a place where I think threat modeling really makes a big difference, but involving the people who are going to be coding in that threat modeling practice. So help them think through how that might be hacked and how that might be uh, vulnerable so that you can be thinking about security all the way through. Uh, perhaps you've heard the phrase of, you know, you want security to be built in rather than bolted on. Um, this is that same idea, really get it from the outset um, versus just kind of coming up with, you know, 17 characteristics for a new capability. And then number 18 is, oh, by the way, it'll be secure. Right. So we want to be thinking through that um, when we're doing development. Right. I'm a huge fan of developers being able to have what I would call a sanity check. Right. Give me a way to know that the code I've been working on for the last two or three hours is safe, that I didn't introduce anything critical. Make it simple. Make me be able to scope it down to the handful of things I changed and at least have that idea before I go ahead and commit that somewhere because then I can deal with it in context, right? It's very frustrating if you've been coding something and you send it off and you commit it and then three weeks later you get a defect back on it and you have to do the mental mind shift to go, well, what was I doing then? And what did my environment look like? And everything's moved on since then. So really being able to have that in context capability. Um, people are talking about spell checking here, you know, and this idea of being notified. Um, you know, we all remember the days of Clippy and I don't think anybody wants that to come back, but this notion of being able to sanity check before I've committed that to a repository gives me at least an opportunity to fix it if I know how and ask somebody if I don't, right? And then I can get better cooperation with my security teams. Um, we want to work with the existing tool set. This is really important, being able to manage the environment, right? I, I talked a few minutes ago just about how many tools we're dealing with. That, that 30 to 130 that you saw was just in the security space. So when you start thinking about it for everything else, um, it's really important for security to be able to be a little more seamless in the pipeline and outside the pipeline 
to allow people to see things a little bit better. So we want to work with that existing tool set we have. Um, I remember being in a conference last year, listening to a CISO on stage. And one of the things he said was, we bought all these tools because they were all best at breed. Right. We bought a best of breed static engine, a best of breed dynamic engine, a best of breed I asked and best of breed networking and identity and access management endpoints, so on and so forth. He said we never really stopped much to ask if what we already had solved what that new requirement was. We just kept getting best of breed. And so that's how a lot of these start to proliferate. They buy a tool to solve a problem. They get a new problem. And hey, who, who does that best? Let's bring that in. Right. Or if you're doing a lot of line of business and you say to them, hey, go go do what you got to do. You get what you want. Use what you need to. That kind of thing. Um, you can end up with a lot of these disparate tool sets everywhere. So integration is now a big, big part of it. You want tools that support a DevOps approach. So where security is concerned, it's not just about gatekeeping and prevention. We really want to turn security into a business enabler. So being able to provide feedback, being able to let people fix things early, being able to prioritize well. Um, this also gets into the space of can we get rid of false positives? Um, and the thing I really worry about, right, because there's so much talk about false positives, I'm much more concerned with the false negatives, right? The things that are ticking time bombs in our app that we haven't found yet, but we need to. Right. So those we need tools that are supporting those things and allowing me to deal with real issues rather than chasing rat holes and, and rabbit trails and those kinds of things. Um, we need to verify everything everywhere. Right. And when we talk about IoT and we talk about microservices and APIs and the things that they're associated with, we get into the container discussion. We get into the fact that people are taking smaller bits and putting them in multiple places, build once, run everywhere. Um, and so we have to be able to verify and validate in those environments as we're deploying. Um, and now it used to be that the story was, okay, we'll package really well what you go, what you're going to put into the container uh, because containers are immutable and everything's going to be fine. So you verify it beforehand and you'll be good on the back end. Well, that's not really the case, right? We know that there are issues in some of those places. And so now there is that tendency that I want to validate what's inside the container. And I want to validate it where it where it ends up and make sure that everything kind of lined up end to end. Um, and I kind of analogize it to those larger cargo containers we've all seen on ships. Right. If you were ordering a vehicle, you know, you might care a little bit about what's inside the container. You would want it to be a little clean. You know, you'd want the environment to not scratch it. You want to be covered, stuff like that. But there's a giant difference between whether it's a vehicle or whether you're sending over groceries. Right. If you're doing a big food shipment now, all of a sudden, I care about the inside of that container a whole lot more. I care about humidity. I care about temperature. I care about volume. Um, all of those things that are going to get in there. I care whether or not there's insects, right, and spoilage. So those things matter. And that's what's kind of happening in software is that people are getting very concerned about seeing inside the container, validating what's in the container. So it's verification everywhere. Um, we have to be able to obviously rapidly identify, but I also think understand and remediate the security vulnerabilities we're coming into. So this gets into a priority discussion. So it's one thing to run a scan and have a bunch of vulnerabilities and we do some triage. And there was a study that came out not too long ago. It was like late 2018, early 2019 with the Ponemon Institute that found that the average security professional right, is spending more than 25 hours a week simply triaging results, right, trying to prioritize, trying to see what's in there. That's a lot of time. And, and for that to then feed back into development, that means you're getting, you know, several days worth of delay in trying to get to development what needs to be fixed. And, and I mentioned before, when it's out of context, they've moved on. Right. And so now that mental shift comes back in. So being able to remediate well and identify quickly is hugely important. Um, and then the last kind of thing here is we want it to be continuous. Right. So uh, recently did a webinar on continuous security with a couple of my colleagues that you can find uh, out on Bright Talk and a few other places. But the things that we talked about there were these capabilities that come in and allow us to continue to go around the loop. How do we educate? How do we train? How do we audit? How do we measure, right? How do we get the most out of what we're doing? 
those things are really important in feeding back into the cycle. So we want to be able to make sure that our teams are able to be productive. So we want to know that people can code better. We want to take advantage of, hey, you know, Joe over here found this particular vulnerability and fixed it. Um, and now Steve in this other department, he's going to try to, you know, running into the same thing. Well, rather than reinvent the wheel, can we share that information and allow it to work a little bit better and then maintain those investments? So all of those things kind of coming in um, and intersecting, we'll kind of look at the pipeline a little bit to see how that comes together. Um, so what you're looking at here is an application uh, security framework that I got from Vendana Verma, who recently gave a talk at DEF CON, and I'm using this with her permission, um, to just really outline some of the important things that are really paramount in a successful application security program. So everything from how you gather requirements all the way out to the knowledge management on the back end, right? That continual learning I was just talking about. So threat modeling is in there, right? The source code review, the vulnerability testing, the defect tracking, all of these things working together to come in. OWASP has got a lot of different tools and things I'll kind of highlight towards the end um, on a bunch of them in these different areas. But the things that are really, really important here are making people aware of these different aspects and how they can participate. So particularly when you get into the threat modeling and the SCA pieces and developers using open source, how do we equip them to be able to work a lot better and code more securely right from the start? Goes a long way in this space in helping us where IoT is concerned. So a couple of different areas I'm gonna to touch on in this. One of them is gonna be APIs, the other one's gonna be microservices. So with APIs, right, um, I'm a big 80s kid. I was born in 1970, so, uh, you know, the 80s music is, is me, and I love it. And I, I really thought this uh, kind of hit home for me when I was thinking about APIs and what they do, right? And this notion of voices carry. Now, the commercial here is more uh, from a Super Bowl ad from a few years ago. And if you get the deck, you can kind of play that out. But the the commercial there was talking a lot about, well, what happens if Alexa loses its voice? And they brought in a bunch of different celebrities to, you know, mimic uh, responding to different people as they were trying to do things. So my favorite was, you know, somebody who had uh, asked Alexa for a very simple recipe and Gordon Ramsay sitting on a, a rowing machine yelling at them about how simple this should be and you shouldn't need a recipe, you should know how to do that, right? Uh, stuff like that. But the point here that I really wanted to get at is that when APIs are involved, um, and we're leveraging them on devices, it's important to remember that devices will likely talk to other devices. It's not just device to a database or a command center, but it's probably devices to a command center, to another database, to another device, to another area. And how we authenticate and validate through that chain is really, really important. So it's an API talking to an API talking to an API um, and, and intersecting on all of these different areas. And so when you think about the mobile banking example with my son, right, him being able to stand there, look at his phone, take a picture, have that interact with his account, have it get credited, have his balance update, and all of that happening within a span of a few minutes, all of these different transactions going on under the hood and everything has to work. And we want all of that to be secure. So that's a challenging problem, but that's what we're dealing with. And people assume that because it's happening and because the app is working, that we're doing those kind of things on the back end. So what does happen when you assume, right? So think through when you have an API that's talking to another API, um, did you pause and verify that the calling user had the rights to use the object that, that you're now acting on. Does that API allow to it? Or did you just kind of inherit it and assume that, hey, I got in here, so everything must be good, right? What happens if that then calls another API from there? Um, and then we talk about the validation piece. So we get into those devices and the, the weak passwords. So are you using MFA? Most people are, but can we do better? Can we go into biosensors? And if you're leveraging social media and someone's social media profile, right? Log into my site using Facebook or Twitter or Google. Are we validating those? Are we letting them know? Um, you know, I, I get those notices from Google every time a new device connects or I log in somewhere and I appreciate the fact that, hey, they noticed and said, hey, this is a little bit different, right? We wanna make sure that we're not just assuming that whoever is calling has the right to be there, but we want to make sure that they are supposed to be there, right? That we validate that all along. Now, I love the picture here because I have no idea what the story behind it was. Um, I'm trying to understand what would cause somebody to have to put that in there other than somebody obviously climbed in the cage and did that, right? So 
same kind of thing. You might assume if you were the zookeeper, you wouldn't need to put a sign like that up, but guess what? Somebody does something crazy, sign goes up, right? Same kind of thing. Um, so here, I, I want to talk about protecting while persisting. So this notion of we try to make it easy and we try to make it convenient by persisting data either on a device or in a database somewhere. Um, and sometimes that has that sensitive information. Now we know that we don't want to write sensitive information to places if we can prevent it. So obviously that's the best course. But in those cases where we do, we want to think about where are we putting that on the device? Is it in internal storage? If Are we putting it on an external SD card because that's convenient, right? We think about where that's stored and then how it's accessed. And there was a really interesting uh, session done at Black Hat earlier this year where somebody talked about, hey, you think by shutting down the device, it all goes away, but there are those moments where things still persist in RAM or they still persist somewhere in the device. And if people are timing it well, they're jailbreaking in the right fashions, these things can actually be vulnerable and caught. And so giving people a way to, to get their data out and, and have it sanitized and have it you know unavailable and, and only using it for what we need is a big, big deal. Now, what you're looking at here on the right is from Strava, which is a fitness app that I use a lot for running and cycling. And this is just one of the runs I did, you know, a while ago. And, and that map feature there is what I wanted to highlight and, and have important, right? So I went onto the site, pulled this up not too long ago, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So obviously this is not an area anywhere near where I live, but it did track a run I did on a trip. And so, you know, kind of if you were following along, you could go, hey, Rob's in Texas that week, right? And so just those little kinds of bits of information. Now, what's interesting is when I go now, right, and Strava kind of got smart, they will not show the maps around where I live. So if I go on a run that's, you know, less than, say, four miles or so, and I don't get very far from my house, but I'm looping around, I come back and, and I see the stats, I see the time and the distance and pace and stuff like that, but the map part is turned off. Um, and that's again, so that people have some sense of privacy, but that data is still sort of there, right? People can kind of extrapolate out if, if you want. So while I want the convenience of being able to trace runs over time and compare to people who are running similar segments, we have to be very, very careful with the data we choose to expose and where we choose to expose it and who we choose to expose it to while that's out there. So that, that idea of, again, protecting while it's persisting. So it's very, very important. And if you're thinking serverless, right? And so that becoming a big issue now where we're sharing resources with machines and, and we're bringing things up and putting them down. So those things are even more important because there is that chance that if something vulnerable gets on that shared resource, everything else on there could be vulnerable as well. And especially if they haven't thought through good application security to prevent that. So we have to think through that the configurations that we're putting in place for when we go to serverless, um, all of the other things that, that are going on with that, we have to remember it's not in isolation. So don't just protect the outside, right? Pretend again, your firewall and, and your network and your identity management. Think about protecting from the inside out as well. So I always like to think about, you know, with application security, it's that inner layer. So even if I get through everything else and I can get to the app, if the application itself is built securely, I'm going to have a very difficult time doing something wrong with it. So it's not just outside in, but also inside out working together. Um, this is the OWASP top 10 for API security, right? And stuff like that. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of these because they really relate to those points around making sure that we're not taking users' data and leaving it out there or allowing people access that they shouldn't have. So that broken object level authorization, the broken authentication, the excessive data exposure, really go back into those things around who has access and who's allowed to do things. Um, and then are we allowing that data to hang on, right? And then when we have the logging and the monitoring sort of down on the bottom, that being insufficient, that goes back to the visibility issue I was talking about before, where we don't really know what's going on, but we need to, right? And as, fortunately, as devices are starting to get a little bit better, we can handle larger levels of encryption, dealing with things in transit a little bit better, and we can take advantage of them. 
right? So some of the good ideas here when you start thinking about APIs, and I kind of put a tweet out here for SD Times and where this article came from, um, but a lot of these things I think are really important. Like if you're using an API gateway, right, which we should be, use one that has bot detection, right, so that you know when you're getting flooded and you can take corrective action right away. Um, you need to have policies on your proxy. So this is going to help you with restricting the access to, you know, the legitimate users, the folks that can be there, right? And then think about the request limits so that even if a legitimate user gets in in the wrong way and things start flooding the system, right? Somebody comes in with unauthorized access, but under a legitimate account, you don't want to get that flooded and overrun and end up with denial of service and those kinds of things. So have those request limits in place so that you're protected. And then think about both authentication and authorization, not just one or the other, right? The authentication is who, right? Are they allowed in there and can they be? And then the authorization is the what, what, what can they do? What can they access on? Don't assume that if you got the token for this, that everything is good. So you have to go through and make sure that both of those things are in place, the authentication and the authorization. Um, and OpenID Connect is something that can kind of help out with that uh, from the OWASP side. Um, so a couple words now on microservices. So the first thing I want to say here is, again, make the point for threat modeling. So yes, microservices are smaller. Um, they tend to be you know, smaller code bases. They tend to be a little less involved. Um, but the more that you separate out and kind of put these things independently, the more they, own need, they all need their own protection, their own disaster recovery, their own backup, their own kind of, you know, monitoring and measuring and those kinds of things. And you want to think through how they might be used in all kinds of interesting and fun ways, right? So years ago, I mentioned I, I was a configuration management guy, and we used to use a defect tracking system. And our defect tracking system was initially designed to basically submit requests and sort of follow the workflows through so that we knew what was happening and, and sort of be able to prioritize. But what ended up happening is it sort of became the de facto policy guide and enforcer because people were writing all kinds of hooks and utilities and things around that tool because they could. So they would enforce policy through the CRM system, whether it was approvals, whether it was, you know, information getting sent to a different team, recategorization, um, interactions with the source code repository system, all of that kind of stuff. And what ended up happening was, you know, you had people using this tool for all kinds of things that it was never intended for. Well, hackers are often out there looking at applications, doing things that no one ever thought about or really intended, right? When we talk about, you know, the initial days of SQL injection, none of us really would have thought, hey, if I go into a form and I type negative one or I type one equals one into a form, something like that, hey, I, now I can get unauthorized access, right? It didn't occur to us, but that's what these guys are thinking. They're taking edge cases. They're taking advantage of, of flaws in the code, um, and being able to go in there. And I think when we get people involved in thinking through upfront what it might look like and how they might be attacked, people start sharing ideas and people say, oh, hey, I didn't think about that. Maybe I should. And it builds a better landscape for all of us. So getting your developers involved in the threat modeling process opens up some eyes and opens up some ears and allows for uh, a little bit more fun. I'm a big fan of the whole elevation of privilege. It's a card game that's out there that can be used to do this. If you haven't done much with that before, it's available through both Microsoft and GitHub for free. And I put the links in there. Um, but that's a great way to just get people thinking about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and all of the different kinds of threat vectors and techniques that are out there to, that they have to be kind of aware of uh, and start coding against. They can lead to some really good discussions. Um, and so when I think about microservices, you know, I love Abbott and Costello and the Who's On First routine, and it seemed to actually fit really well with the idea of what I, I wanted to get at in here with when you think about microservices, right, it's the who, it's the what, and it's the where, right? So who being first is who are you including in the planning, right? Who's developing that microservice? Is it somebody who just kind of goes off and says, I want to do this, or is there some thought around it? Is it tied to a release effort? Those kinds of things. And how are those requirements then communicated? Is it managed as part of the backlog or are we avoiding technical debt, right? And are we kind of adding to that by, you know, pulling in from other things. What's the strategy that you're using? Are you refactoring or are you using a strangler pattern or are you doing something else, 
right? So thinking about who's involved, the strategy connected to those things allows us then to start looking at this with, you know, a lens of security and saying, okay, where are some of those touch points? What are some of the things I've got to be uh, more aware of? So think about the who, um, what being second, right? What microservices have a couple of things that um, are really, really good, but they make security a little bit harder. The first one of them being that you can deploy them anywhere, right? They're independent. So you kind of build it once, throw it in a lot of different places. Um, I like to say same faces, different places. So you have to think about all of those. And the microservice itself, you might be deploying that same entity into a number of different places, but each one of those places it's deployed to is an environment that's a little bit different from every other environment that it's deployed into. And so we have to think about it that way that we can't assume that what we're deploying into is entirely safe. So let's make what we're sending there safe and look at it that way. And the other thing is that they're loosely coupled. So you can't really depend on them getting security from something else. So treating them like independent little applications and securing them holistically versus assuming that I'm gonna drop it into a network that's got a fully functioning firewall or that has great endpoint management or that's doing identity and access management really well. Um, we can't make assumptions about the environment itself uh, unless we know it completely. That's often not the case when we're doing containers and, and deploying to all these different spots. Um, and then the second thing is what really are you making? So when you're making it, are you scanning it? Are you looking for vulnerabilities? Um, the integration tests here are vital right? Not just from a capability standpoint, but from a security standpoint. And if we're really good, this is where we use interactive application security testing. And we take advantage of getting more bang for the buck out of our functional testing because we're doing security testing alongside of it. So as we interact with the application, bubbling up security vulnerabilities that it runs into, that's a great way to be able to, you know, in a sense, kill two birds with one stone, um, but really make our integration testing more valuable because we're getting both of those things, the capabilities and the security at the same time. So I recommend that one highly. And then the third part is, you know, and I call this, I don't know, right? The third basement that they keep coming back to, but really I don't know where, right, is on third. And so the idea here goes back to SCA, right? The composition, understanding what I have. So, Recent study that came out from Sonatype um, showed that only about 45% of the mature organizations, so these are guys who are doing DevOps well and who you know have got good practices in place, it's still less than half of the organizations maintaining a full software inventory. So that's a problem, right? We don't really know what we have. So that means when we have to go patch something, or when we have to go fix something, or when we have to know all the places we've deployed something somewhere, we, we can't answer that question very well, right? Because we don't really know what we have. And we get into the open source world, we're not sure what components we're using, where we're using them, whether we have the licensing rights to use them, all of those kinds of things. And when you look at the immature organizations, right? Those that are still kind of adopting practices or maybe haven't fully got there yet, that's only about 26% of them. So more people than not, are really struggling to try to say, what do I really have as my software inventory? So when we get into IoT and there's so much open source now being leveraged in these places as, as those microservices and APIs are being written, these things are gonna cause more problems if we don't know what we have, right? The other thing there is where are the containers themselves going? So when we're delivering, are we using pods? Are we using clusters? Or are we doing the serverless model? Because the resources that we connect to and the environment we drop into matter. So we have to think about those kinds of things. Um, and when you look at some of the mature practices, so you go back to saying, okay, well, who's doing things somewhat well, those the mature organizations? Well, the, the whole CSA, right? The computational analysis, the DAST, software composition, all of these kinds of things they're being done about twice as more often than the immature. So the mature organizations are at least using these practices to try to raise visibility on what they're doing. And so I think that's a really important part of this in, in being able to better identify what you really have, where it is and how vulnerable it is. So knowing where things are becomes really, really important. Okay, um, question around this, you know, this whole notion of 
whether or not we can see things. There's a lot of conversations these days about value streams and leveraging value streams, you know, for DevOps and workflows and seeing work as it moves through. Well, the question I have there is, is security showing up in your value stream? Is security a part of that conversation? Um, can you leverage security as a gatekeeper if you need to in the value stream? Uh, one of the cool things about this and what we're looking at here, it just happens to be a value stream from HCL. It's the uh, Accelerate tool. But I, what I've highlighted in that red box is this the ability to get information on security testing as part of the value stream so that we can see it in context with the other work. What's important there is very often people believe that adding security into your pipeline is going to slow things down, create inefficiencies, add more noise, that kind of thing. Well, this allows you to visualize it a little bit better. And what we want to be able to do is, is turn security from a must have into a business enabler. So being able to show where does security make an impact and does it really slow us down? Is it really preventing us from moving forward or is it overall helping us because we're avoiding those critical issues at the 11th hour when the release is coming out and our pen testing team has finally come back and said, hey, you've got a critical issue you got to deal with. So we want to be able to get that information in context with everything else. What that sort of looks like is, is this notion of getting a chain of custody to go through to production. And it's really just kind of knowing, OK, for any given piece of work, what was connected to it? What were the tool sets? What were the things that were involved? You know, what were the pieces that, that fit in? And then how did that all sort of tie together in some record of what happened as that's moving through? So the point being, whatever you're using for your value streams and whatever tooling, you know, is you're leveraging in that, you want to be able to ensure that security is part of the conversation and it's in context with the other things that are going so that you can answer those questions about how security is really impacting workflow. And, and again, be able to turn that into more of an enabler for you on the back end, because when we release things well and production is safe, trust goes up and our loyal, you know, our user base can have much more confidence in what we're doing. So those things are really important. Okay. So I mentioned before that there were a number of different OWASP tools that are relative to that framework that Vendana shared. So this was another slide from her deck kind of outlining in those different areas what OWASP has according to the requirement gathering and the threat modeling, code reviews, the vulnerability testing that's out there, defect tracking, and so on. So if you're not doing some of these things, this is a great way to start being able to add some of these things in. And of course, we don't want to boil the ocean here, but but really I think the places where we can make a big difference for the IoT space um, in understanding kind of the landscape is really around the threat modeling, the source code review piece, the SCA, and sort of that vulnerability testing. So those kind of three blocks, you know, in the left, just to the right of the requirements. Um, because again, it helps us expose kind of the who, what, and where of, of what we are doing and what we're trying to do as we move it forward. So, um, okay, so just kind of close this out a little bit with some just sort of final observations uh, around sort of this DevOps loop and, and kind of what we've talked about. So. Um, I've said it several times, but I really believe that when we get people in the same room and dev and security start talking to one another, we get some really good things to start happening. Um, threat modeling is a great way to kind of help level the playing field and get people on the same page. It eliminates a lot of the blame game. Um, if the only time dev and security are talking to one another is because there's a critical vulnerability that has to be fixed, we're missing an opportunity to really learn from one another and, and make it a little bit easier for security to have a few less alerts to deal with and dev to have a few less false positives to chase. Um, the second thing is, is asking, you know, what are your developers really able to do? Can they run sanity checks from within their IDE to know that their code is safe before they commit it? Do they have a way to do that, right? Because that's going to help them be able to get better and better as they go and the overall risk start to go down from what they're introducing. Um, the second thing there too is if you're using a lot of open source and they're using it or you're going into places like Git and, and things like that, pulling it down, um, are you verifying it before it's used? So does your Git action, you know, go in and do a scan on a pull request? So if you're 
things into your repository and you're bringing that stuff in, are you validating it before you kind of merge it with what you have and start leveraging it or start writing things against that library? Um, do you have a way to, to sanitly or and, and sanitize what you've got to be able to ensure that it's safe and ensure that you can use it well? Okay. Excuse me. So third thing, right? When you start getting into the build, so we do a lot of static testing typically at the developer level, it's a little bit easier because we're working with the source. But when we start incorporating dynamic testing as part of our builds, how often are we doing that, right? Because there are things that dynamic testing will tell us that static doesn't and vice versa. So it's particularly important when we're looking at key integration points. So the end of a sprint at, at a release cycle, right? We want to be able to at least periodically get that information into our system so that it can fit into our feedback loops. And again, it becomes part of the overall picture um, and validating what we're seeing and being able to work with. Um, I mentioned I asked in the context of functional testing before, and I think this is a really cool spot for QA teams and a place where we're starting to see um, an intersection from quality assurance and security coming together. You know, we had a recent study done that I read and showed something like, you know, 10 to 12 percent of QA teams were now starting to get asked to incorporate security testing into what they do. Well, if we leverage I asked well, they can run that right alongside the functional testing that they're doing. And so that makes it very easy for them to kind of incorporate those things. And when you start getting security feedback from all the parts of your pipeline, the value of that goes way up, right? Information goes through, we learn a little bit better. We understand where the real issues in our code base are. We can deal with things in a lot better context. So while you can leverage IAST all the way out to production and you can have it running on an app, you just need that app running somewhere. Um, it fits really, really nicely in with what QA is trying to do and get a sense of the health of that application before it moves on to production. Um, if you're using a SIM, if you're doing RASP, right, how much of that information is actually working its way back and influencing what's happening in development and in the backlog? So are those alerts, are those events, are those kinds of things that are being found working their way back? And so people can then start looking at, well, why are we getting these and what can we do to prevent them? Does it, uh, does it influence what happens in the backlog? Does it get prioritized or do we just kind of leave it to our ops and our security uh, operations center to kind of deal with those things, but we never actually take it back in to look at the root cause, right? So we want to make sure those things are filtering in. And if you're doing audits and most of us are, right? If we're in a regulated industry, we have to deal with that. Well, does that security audit work its way back in, right? When was the last time your pen testers went down and had a conversation with developers um, about how to do things better? When was the last time that audit and compliance report worked its way back into a dev manager to triage against the, the backlog and the technical debt that's there to make that work? So we wanna be thinking through how those, those things on the back end are working all the way into the front end, right? And it's those feedback loops that we talk about so often in the DevOps world, but when we're doing it with security, we need to be taking that in as well. We need to be thinking through how to get information out of the SOC and into development in a way that makes both more productive. So, okay, so real quick uh, in summary, right? When we're talking about these areas, um, the big things, you know, know the landscape. Where are things going? Who's doing it? What are we building? Understand that, get control of where things are. Um, I talk a lot about not letting your APIs turn into IIIs, right? So this, we don't want headaches from them. So it gets into the authentication and the authorization discussion, protecting data, you know, and, and not letting it persist longer than it needs to, those kinds of things. Um, and then with your microservices, you know, pay attention to that micro, you know, who, what, and where. Um, who's doing it? What are we building? Where is it going? How do we secure along the way? Um, if you want to reach out, uh, talk to me, connect further, you can see my information there on the, the side. Um, but with that, I'll just say thanks and uh, open it up for any questions. Thanks a lot, Rob. So yeah, uh, that was a wonderful talk and there aren't really any questions at the moment, but if anybody wants to chime in and just give their two cents or uh, you know, ask any question, um, please feel free to do so in the chat window. And 
obviously if not you know you you left your twitter handle up there so they can always reach out to you um via that way and uh, actually i can put it up on screen now too just to help out sure. uh, but yeah we can we can hang on for another minute or so and then like just <laughs> call it I like the looks like I've got a game to download after this. Yeah, that, that was my reaction the first time I saw it. Um, and, and I'm actually considering doing this. So I have a daughter at the University of Arizona, and I um, started talking to them quite a bit about security. And interestingly enough, it actually started with a user experience meetup group. And so a bunch of guys doing form design and stuff like that. And they had a speed dating session. So you literally were in this kind of hotel lobby and every two minutes, somebody rang a bell and you went and met somebody else. And so the intros all, almost all of them went something like, Hey, you know, I'm so-and-so I do user experience. Um, I make forms, that kind of thing. What do you do? Oh, I'm in cybersecurity. And they would look at me and go, what are you doing here? Like they didn't think it had any connection whatsoever. And so my answer to them was, was largely the same. I was like, well, do you care what happens when somebody hits submit? you know, what goes on there, right? That information. And, and all of a sudden the light bulb kind of went off for them. It's like, they didn't necessarily need to know security, but they needed to think about it. And so, you know, started talking to them, did a whole um, session on GDPR where, where they came in and they said, Hey, you know, we want to talk security for 10 minutes. Well, we mentioned that and it turned into a 90 minute discussion with people asking, well, are we going to go to jail and could we be at risk and all of those kinds of things? Um, because, you know, again, you have to think about, where that data is going and where it's getting stored. And so you see security intersecting all of these different kinds of things. Well, that led to discussions with the business school and you know classrooms and whatnot. And so one of the things I think would be really fun is to take students and do a workshop with that kind of threat modeling thing. And I'm just trying to think of ways to make it a little bit easier for them to intersect because if you don't know much um, technically, if you haven't done a lot of software development, it can be a little bit more intimidating uh, for some of those because you, you start talking about phishing and spoofing and, you know, cred, cred management and encryption and stuff like that. And so, um, but for folks that are in software, great way to get started in that. A um, lot of fun can be had there. And again, it's, it's another way of getting people to talk about things without pointing fingers at your code or, you know, that mistake that was made or you broke the build kind of stuff. Um, so I think that makes, uh, makes it a lot easier. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, doesn't look like there are any questions at the moment. So if you want, we can just call it here. And if you have any questions, just uh, let me let me put that up one more time. All right. Uh, yeah. So obviously, feel free to reach out to um, you know for for any follow up questions or if you want to yep. just give a shout outs, I guess. Oh, uh, let's see here. Um, All the hype using distributed ledgers. Yeah, with hype five G higher throughput. Yeah, there's, there is a lot of hype around it and a lot of concern, right? And people are looking at 5G and thinking, well, oh, this is an election year and are they using things, you know, for that? Um, I haven't looked into a whole lot on the distributed ledger piece, so I don't want to, you know, talk about something I'm not all that familiar with. But there's certainly, um, at least here in the SoCal area, a lot of, you see a lot of ads for 5G. You see a lot of like, hey, this is going to be great, right? Things going faster, better. Um but, but wondering on the back end, right? Quietly thinking through, well, what does this mean? And um, very close to an elementary school. And so there was a huge amount of churn and noise when the whole 5G thing started up because people were concerned about the sensors and emissions from them and what would that do? Uh, so I see more around those kind of things, the, you know, the, the radiation levels, if you will, and um, what, that piece, but I do think that there are data privacy issues and that whole trading of convenience that has to. Um, Rob, I think we lost you for just a second. If you uh, if you can still hear me, just let me know. Nope. All right. Um, <laughs> well, I do apologize for the end to that question, um, but it does. Look like uh, the 
uh, Rob has disconnected. So unfortunately, um, we're going to shut down the broadcast now. So if you have any further questions, um, please feel free to reach out. And I hope you all have a wonderful night and take care. Bye.